Hello, my name is G4, and I am here to talk to you today about proto-freelancing in the wrong direction, my accidental quest to model the near future. So first off, a little bit about myself in case you didn't see the other two presentations. My name is G4, I am a graduate student in molecular astrobiology at the Pennsylvania State University, and I have one academic byline to my name. I also have a slight problem with travel. As of just a few weeks ago, I hit all 50 states when I visited Oklahoma uh, at the NMRA National convention uh, in Grapevine, Texas. Uh, also, oddly enough, uh, I originally started off by modeling ON30 in the 1890s. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. And then also, I am quite possibly the first openly trans non-binary model railroader and the 18 millionth autistic model railroader. Anyway, so this is part three in what I'm calling my modern modeling anthology. In the event that you didn't see the previous two presentations, part one is called Modeling Modern Transit Systems, where I introduce the topic of modern transit and try to make the point that it relates to regular model routing subjects. Part two is when I zoom in on DMU specifically as the most promising modern transit technology and show you what a layout and operating sessions would look like with that. And then part three is here, where we kind of wrap up a few of the ideas. Um, but as far as a brief outline of this presentation goes, uh, <laughs> Okay. One day I was sitting at work and the idea for this presentation just lightning bolted itself into my head and I became so consumed I had to get my thoughts out somehow, so I made this outline and then more or less broke it up one bullet point per slide, added a few pictures, and well, here we are. But as for a realistic outline for this presentation, I want to highlight state-supported Amtrak corridors as having had the largest ridership growth of any form of Amtrak travel, as well as also being the most competitive mode of transport with cars. I also want to demonstrate the feasibility of modeling the near future utilizing state DOT document archives. Uh, I want to inspire you to find your own future passenger rail corridor, either for your own near future layout or for bringing to your real world community. And then maybe we can share in my long, slow slide into insanity along the way and have a few laughs, perhaps. But let's begin with my personal history with passenger trains. So I had a dreadfully suburban childhood uh, in South Florida and Provo, Utah, which, as you can see here from these representative images, are absolutely wretched places to live, devoid of any sort of culture, intrigue, or charisma. But in 2012, I moved to Seattle for undergrad at the University of Washington. And to anybody who knows Seattle, it has the Link Light Rail. Um, and to anybody who knows was me, I went massively far out of my way to take the choo-choo whenever I had the opportunity, uh, and I started to learn about public transit. I want to shout out here specifically the Seattle Transit blog, as they taught me a lot of what I know on the subject. But also to anybody who knows the region, there is Amtrak Cascades, uh, a 1990s state-supported consolidation of a bunch of discoordinated name trains, mostly between Seattle and Portland, but with additional trips north to Vancouver and south to Eugene. And they got up to 10 daily Seattle to Portland round trips pre-COVID, with plans for 13. Uh, but the thing that everybody knows them for is their extremely charismatic Talgo train sets. But I want to make the point here that Cascades is loved by modelers and rail fans alike. It has big cities, small towns, modern architecture, dramatic scenes, and simply gorgeous scenery. I mean, just look at this. What is not to love about it? It's absolutely fantastic. But it's also worth pausing for a second and asking, what is a Talgo? So a thing that a lot of people don't know is that the limiting factor of passenger train speed is not necessarily track geometry, it's actually lateral force. Courses. Utilizing existing technology, you can run passenger cars around existing corners at higher speeds, but if the passengers are being constantly plastered up against one wall or the other whenever the train goes around a curve, that's not exactly a viable means of transport. So you can fix this via multiple methodologies. One is to super elevate the track, to tilt the track, or you can tilt the train. And you can do that either by a, a conventional powered tilting train, which requires pistons and hydraulics and computers and knowledge of the track geometry, or you could do something called passive tilting, which uses the geometry of the car suspension system to float the axis of rotation in open space above the car body, such that whenever the train goes around a corner, the train set itself just naturally floats out to one side or another in perfect proportion to the amount of uh, forces that it's experiencing. Uh, and this is a much simpler and lower maintenance way to cheat about an extra 15 miles per hour of, of track speed around existing track conditions. Uh, and Talgos are just a specific Spanish brand of a passively tilting married train set. It's also worth highlighting the appeal of the 
the train set itself. So a married train set is actually more efficient. Uh, it doesn't require turning or switching at the ends of the line. You can use push-pull operations. But also unique to Amtrak Cascades are the F40PH cab baggage units, or cabbages. They took old locomotives, stripped them of their prime mover, and replaced it with a roll-side door for a baggage compartment, and filled the uh, fuel tank with concrete to weight it down. But importantly, they kept the control stand intact, allowing you to operate the single F59PHI at the other end of the train, but making the train set, uh, in effect, truly bidirectional. And this also solves the problem of so-called blunt ends, where uh, you have just an arbitrary slice of Amfleet receding into the distance, like somebody cut a baguette or something. Um, but also uh, wrapped in with this is overall better branding. Again, unlike a sterile silver Amfleet, which could be seen anywhere in the entire country, instead, Amtrak Cascades had an extremely charismatic paint scheme uh, titled Evergreen Espresso and Cream, which I can imagine nothing more Pacific northwestern than that. And so all of this makes Amtrak Cascades train sets modern and sleek, as opposed to things like this, where you have incredible discoordination between the locomotive and the passenger cars, or even the passenger cars and themselves. These do not scream modern and sleek. So in terms of recent developments, as I'm certain you can infer with the new Charger locomotives, the spoiler on the Amtrak California Chargers uh, to bring them up to the level of the uh, Superliner passenger cars gets the G4 seal of approval for being modern and sleek. However, the mismatching of the paint scheme between the Siemens Midwest Chargers and the new Siemens Venture Coaches does not get the G4 seal of approval for being modern and sleek. Anyway, the point here is that I want to make is that more places should have sleek modern train sets in order to improve their branding and people's willingness to ride them. Anyway, let's get back to my story. There was one very important and memorable experience that I had. I was in Olympia, Washington Station, and I needed to get back north to Seattle uh, in order to make it in time for a class, but the train was an hour and 15 minutes behind schedule, and there was worry that I was going to arrive to class late. But then, all of a sudden, things started happening. Two freight trains approached the station from opposite directions, importantly on the station platform track, and they both stopped short of the station, importantly also stopping short of two crossovers. Then I saw Amtrak Cascades coming down the track uh, northbound, but it was on the wrong main and couldn't access the station platform. But all of a sudden, it took one of the crossovers, picked us up at the platform, took the other crossover, uh, and took us all the way north. Ultimately, we ended up making it back in time for class, almost halving our delay, but importantly, this taught me two things. First off, that Centralia South Dispatcher is a dick who hates passenger trains. I don't care how much track work there was going on in Kelso Longview. But more realistically, this showed me firsthand how passenger trains fit into the broader railroading ecosystem. There was a physical person who was sitting down in Fort Worth, Texas, who saw that the passenger train was behind schedule, and he manipulated the freight trains around the physical infrastructure of the tracks in order to both give the passenger train access to the station platform and also hopscotch the passenger train around the two freight trains. It was absolutely fantastic and masterful work. So over the intervening years, I've had a total of 34 different trips on Amtrak over 18 different routes for a total of 16,660 miles, or 26,812 kilometers. And most recently, as you can see here, I was able to fit in the Heartland Flyer from Fort Worth, Texas to Oklahoma City, marking my 50th state. Anyway, so now that we've gone through my personal story, you might be wondering to yourself, why are intercity short-haul passenger trains so important anyway? Well, everybody of course knows of the Northeast Corridor, and this makes complete sense for passenger trains. You have what's called the Northeast Megalopolis, an uninterrupted line of cities going Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, New Haven, Springfield, and Boston. Or as I like to call it, a diarrhea of humanity streaked along the underpants of Mother Nature, where you have so many major cities abutting right up against each other. Of course passenger trains make sense here, because it's so dense and it's all in a line. That is a perfect recipe for a railroad route. However, what a lot of people don't know is that there are a bunch of other routes around the country where this type of service also makes sense, and these are the state-supported routes. Uh, one of them, of course, is Amtrak Cascades, but uh, others include the Empire Corridor going New York, Albany, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo. Uh, Amtrak California has three different routes, uh, uh, one in SoCal and two in NorCal. Uh, and then in the Midwest, you have five, excuse me, four different state-supported corridors, mostly radiating out of Chicago. Now, the thing that makes a state-supported corridor is that it is under 750 miles long and under 12 hours end-to-end, -end, and this also means that you can usually accommodate multiple trips daily, which itself also means that you can have a same-day round trip. You can wake up at your origin, take the train to your destination, do your business, and then, in the same calendar day, catch a train back, such that you don't have to afford overnight accommodations, which is something that not a lot of people may be able to afford. Uh, and, similarly to Amtrak Cascades, the state-supported routes have seen a growth and consolidation from a bunch of uh, other trains since the 1990s, and another interesting thing is that they are usually interlined with long-distance trains, like you can see here on the map of the Midwest. This essentially comes from the fact that the long-distance trains are going to run anyway, whether or not the state pays for its own personal 
trains. So what they end up usually doing is using the long distance train as a bonus round trip, and they schedule their own trains around that in order to have a, a more evenly spaced uh, series of train departures throughout the day. Now, I also happened to learn the importance of these state-supported corridors when I, at the time, was living on Long Island, and I needed to get to a friend in Kalamazoo, Michigan. But a direct flight would have been a whopping $515, which, as a young professional, was not something I could afford. But what I ended up doing instead is I flew from New York to Chicago, I had a bonus day in Chicago, I took the blue water from Chicago to Kalamazoo, saw my friend, took the Wolverine from Kalamazoo to Detroit, and flew back from Detroit to New York. And the grand total sum for this trip was $240, less than half the cost of a direct flight. And this makes complete sense. Both Chicago and Detroit are very major airport hubs, and so it's a lot cheaper to fly into there than to smaller rural communities. But by taking the train, I now have a much better connection to all of these smaller communities. And again, like I said, on top of this, I had bonus days in Chicago and Detroit to explore. Uh, and so it's not just my own personal experience. The scholarly data also shows that intercity passenger trains are an absolutely vital link to the economies of midi and micropolitan communities. And the reason why this is the case is that passenger trains fit perfectly in the category of travel called too short to fly, too long to drive. And if you actually look at these two maps here of the United States, uh, the top one being Amtrak ridership for stations around the country, and the bottom one being a map of the state-supported corridors, you can see quite plainly here that the most popular stations are the ones that have these short-haul intercity passenger trains, with importantly multiple departures daily from them. Uh, and so, as a result, the state-supported corridors have seen the most growth of any form of Amtrak ridership in the past 40 years, even outpacing the growth and ridership of the Northeast Corridor itself. And one of the reasons for this is that passenger trains are disproportionately popular with younger generations, in part because they are the most eco-friendly form of transport that we have. But as good as things are, we obviously could be doing much better. And to make my point, I'm going to bring you some data to show how and why. For one, 80% of Americans currently live in one of these 11 mega regions, but only four of them actually have a reliable intercity passenger service. Another one, according to the most recent census data, 85% of Americans live in cities, and we will only become a more urbanized species with time. And then this is my favorite, uh, uh, because I pulled these data myself from the U.S. Bureau of Transportation Statistics, and yes, they are from 2011, but I'm pretty certain that the patterns still hold. I found that 91% of U.S. leisure travel is under 500 miles, which actually fits perfectly in the break-even distance of uh, higher and high-speed rail, uh, as you can see here. There are a bunch of YouTube videos on the internet showing how high-speed rail can be more time competitive than driving or flying, uh, and I'd recommend them to you, specifically City Nerd. So, recognizing all of this, I decided to do a little bit of civic engagement. Uh, skipping over a, a bunch of steps, I'm actually the dictator of my own micronation. Um, I'm going to build a wall and make America pay for it. And in 2021, when the neighboring country uh, uh, got a new diplomats, uh, Biden and Harris, I decided to send them a letter of congratulations. Because, you know, uh, I am a diplomat on completely equal standing and importance as they are. So I sent about uh, one paragraph congratulating them on their successful election and about eh, seven and a half pages extolling the importance of intercity passenger rail and light rail transport. And then, lo and behold, a short while later, Amtrak released its Connect Us map with all the plans for a, a bunch of new routes. And in fact, many of the routes were ones that I myself had specifically highlighted in my letter. Now, is it likely that I'm single-handedly responsible for the most significant passenger rail expansion in American history? No. Am I going to say that I am anyway? You betcha. But anyway, all of this meant that the short haul of passenger routes were finally getting their due. Brightline was going gangbusters in Florida, the Midwest services were getting new locomotives and European-inspired passenger cars, and all of the routes on the Amtrak Connectus map that were new expansions were of these short haul intercity passenger routes. Um, and then also, this is hot off the presses. Just a few days or weeks ago, I think, uh, the FRA uh, announced a study uh, to massively expand both the short and and long-distance corridors throughout the United States, uh, based primarily on increasing geographic coverage uh, and serving communities that currently don't have uh, of intercity options. Um, and while some of these are long-distance routes, like a, a resurrection of the North Coast Hiawatha, a lot of them actually would be in this short-haul intercity category. So, really fun times we're living in. And, and this all related back to a fun time I had when I got to first-hand experience the uh, growth and expansion of U.S. passenger rail. In 2017, the Washington State Department of Transportation uh, held an event at King Street station called the Siemens Charger Rollout, where we got to see, for the first time to the public, these new Siemens Charger locomotives. Uh, and this it was me witnessing firsthand the growth of a passenger rail in front of me with my own eyes. And I also was witnessed by a YouTuber. Oh, look at the baby little me right there. Oh, I'm so young. Yeah, anyway.
So all this being the case, I simply had to find more information, and I had been a long-time subscriber to the Passenger Train Journal, which is an absolutely fantastic publication that does keep up with a lot of the news of passenger trains at current, but it's also filled with a bunch of articles that primarily highlight the nostalgia of passenger trains past. In addition, it's also a quarterly publication that I just simply devour every time it arrives at my home. So I wanted to find a source for more current and up-to-date information, and I found this enterprising young YouTuber called Worldwide Railfan, uh, who one day, just for the hell of it, decided to email Amtrak PR and say, hey, what's going on with all of these developments? And Amtrak PR said, oh, thank you so much for asking. We've been hoping somebody was paying attention. Please have all of the information. Um, and he got to, uh, access to some pretty major stories and actually was the breaking news source for some of them. Uh, and this eventually became a yearly thing called American High Speed Rail Week, which is absolutely fantastic. Although this year he's late and I'm absolutely devastated. <sighs> anyway, so in year one, he discussed the uh, new Siemens Venture car order. Uh, he also uh, broke the new Amtrak Phase 7 paint scheme for the long distance chargers. And he also found concept art for a train set. Ah! <laughs> okay, calm down, G4. Um, in year two, he discussed the plans for the train set, how they're going to have cab cars like the cabbages, but cooler, and they're going to be on most of the corridor routes, including the Northeast Corridor, Amtrak California, and Amtrak Cascades. Also, the new chargers are going to be forward compatible with an electrification option, where the existing diesel locomotives will be able to plug into passenger cars that have a pantograph on them, effectively making them future-proofed dual-mode locomotives, and some of these train sets are actually going to be bad battery train sets uh, that are going to be used on the Empire Corridor between Albany and Buffalo for a battery electric passenger train. Oh my goodness, it's so cool. But, 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 I, I'm still a regular model railroader. I just like transit advocacy. Right? Right? Oh... Okay, but during this time, I was also learning lessons in transit. So like I said, in 2017, I moved to a job uh, in New York on Long Island, and it's absolutely an awful place to live uh, for absolutely everything except its trains. And so I made the best of a very bad situation, and I extensively explored the entire region by rail. And this, by the way, is a completely accurate map. But in all of my adventures, I was plagued by this one major question. Why do trolleys in the Northeast suck so badly? Uh, and as you can see here on the top, I, I grew up on the West Coast, where we had sleek, new, modern transit systems. But on the bottom, in the East Coast, they had these uh, toasters running around a bunch of these old cities. And so what I describe next is that I basically fell into a Wikipedia hole and broke my leg and couldn't climb out, and then I effectively ended up memorizing the modern transit landscape. Shout out here to Trains, Buses, People, an Opinionated Atlas of U.S. and Canadian Transit. Uh, it is a fantastic book that uh, taught me a lot, and, and I think it's actually a textbook, but it is one hell of a page-turner of a textbook that I absolutely love. But anyway... I eventually became completely subsumed by my knowledge, and I just had to get my thoughts out somehow. So over the COVID lockdown with the Penn State Model Railroad Club, I made a presentation called Modeling Modern Transit Systems, where I basically taught myself urban planning and then showed how modern transit can coexist with traditional model railroading topics. And I gave this uh, first nationally at NMRAX in uh, 2021, uh, virtually, uh, and then I gave it uh, first time in person at Indy Junction in 2022 in Indianapolis. And in the event that you missed that presentation, some highlights include the Atlanta streetcar named Undesirable, 48-ton transit inchworms, and the worst transportation project ever built. Uh, I also then highlighted Escondido, California on the Sprinter DMU hybrid light rail service uh, as being particularly uh, optimal for making a small switching layout, and then that eventually became its own entirely separate presentation, part two of this series, and then I finally ended by calling the hobby of model railroading a boomer nostalgia circle jerk, which it is, somebody needed to say it, so it may as well be me. But, as relates to this particular presentation, I decided to wrap up the, the clinic with a teaser, the idea to model the near future. A and the idea behind this was that, say that you uh, model Kansas City, which does in fact have a real-world streetcar, but say that you model this yard in Kansas City, which is not near the streetcar. The idea here was that you could proto-freelance an extension of the Kansas City streetcar to the portion of Kansas City that you yourself model, and this was a way that I used to relate modern transit to regular model routing topics. But, days before Indy Junction, the idea grew just a little bit uh, into a new teaser. Why not model the actual near future? And the idea behind this is that State Department of Transportations often have uh, public and freely available document archives where they publish basically everything that they work on. And, and these could be um, uh, simple community meetings or broad corridor analyses or specific blueprints and construction plans and choices of concrete or bush species that they're using for use on lines that are currently under construction. 
And so here is my new idea. Don't just proto-freelance the system. Why not prototype model something that just hasn't been built yet? And this actually reminded me uh, of a touchstone of my past, another Seattle Transit blog article that, that was uh, apparently surprisingly impactful. Uh, to anybody who remembers, in 2015, uh, there was an absolutely wretched snowstorm uh, that uh, closed all of the mountain passes uh, east-west between Seattle and Spokane. And what's worse, uh, this was a few days after Christmas. So people who might have uh, been living and working in Seattle and then traveled back to, uh, to Spokane to spend the holidays with their family, they were then trapped on the far side of the state. And to anybody who knows Washington State, there are only four major east-west routes across the Cascades between eastern and western Washington, and only one of them is a highway. The other three are all small, dangerous, uh, two-lane, windy state highways. So with a single well-placed snowstorm, all of a sudden the transportation infrastructure of the entire state became frozen. So the idea that this article was proposing is that Amtrak Cascades already has train sets running north and south between Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, and Eugene. Why not just take one of them and run them east-west, originally along the old route of the Empire Builder, uh, going between uh, Ellensburg, Yakima, uh, and the Pasco Tri-Cities area. Um, but then, uh, at some point, you could eventually rebuild the old Milwaukee Road right-of-way between Ellensburg and Ritzville, with a much more direct route between Seattle and Spokane, offering you east-west rail transit that is actually time-competitive with driving. And so this got me thinking. This would be a fantastic real-world passenger train, and also it would be through a, a fun region, so why not model a near-future passenger train too, not just transit? But, but, but this is just a really interesting idea. It's not like it's what I'm modeling. Right? Right? Oh, okay. Speaking of, what is it that I model anyway? So, when I moved to New York, I discovered the Lilliputians, the main two-foot gauge railroads, and I specifically discovered the Kennebec Central, which was the smallest of them all, five miles long by two feet wide, which ran to uh, kind of a little bit of a, a, a Civil War soldier's home and vacation destination in Maine. And I ended up making this a somewhat ill-fated Fremo module that never really got off the ground or moved too far. But during this time, I then moved to Pennsylvania for graduate school, and you bet that one of the major reasons for choosing to move to Pennsylvania was the fact that it had so much railroad history. Like, obviously, the most famous one being the Pennsylvania Railroad Juniata Locomotive Works. Uh, like, you can see... Wait a second, what's that? Zoom? Zoom? Ah, allow me to introduce to you the Altoona and Beach Creek, or the amusingly acronymed A and B C. Uh, it, it ran six miles up the hill from, as you saw, right across the street of the locomotive works uh, to the Wapsononic Hotel, which was a, a small Gilded Age resort and strolling garden, and they had a, a viewpoint on the top of the mountain. But the real reason for its construction was to go six miles further to some coal mines at Doherty, and it brought coal down the hill uh, to a bunch of distributors uh, in the Altoona and Juniata areas for people to heat their homes during the winter. And while I was researching this railroad, just for fun, I happened to find an old newspaper advertisement uh, of all the departure times at all the stations, um, and I just happened to accidentally make a string line diagram of it, which then I just happened to follow up uh, with a, a, a bunch of other freight trains that could be running around that passenger train, and once I had this operating scheme, which is probably far more dense than the railroad ever saw during its lifespan, I then, just for the fun of it, made a track plan, and then uh, completely by accident, I happened to end up building that track plan, and then, well, the this is where I got to the point of, of mocking up the hotel for a scratch build uh, and nice fun views of uh, rolling hills in uh, central Pennsylvania. But anyway, during this time, I also, like I said, was a member of the Penn State Model Railroad Club, uh, and we did a bunch of things together. We had operating sessions at local clubs, we made a small bend track switching layout, I made a tiny little ON30 pizza display layout based on the Calico Mine Train, um, and uh, we were all encouraged to bring our own equipment and run it on the bend track club layout, which you can see here uh, in the bottom left. And oh, you can see me over Blake's shoulder. Oh, I miss Blake. He was an absolutely fantastic character. But I was encountered with a problem. You see, most people model the diesel era seriously and have a few steam trains around just for fun. But I was modeling the steam era seriously, and I needed to get some diesel trains uh, that I could run on the club layout, and in addition to the fact that I was modeling in the wrong scale. But the question now is, what do I buy? Because depending on what diesel locomotive I get, I might end up tying myself to central Pennsylvania forever, and there's no guarantee that I'm actually going to stay here after graduate school. But then I came up with a fantastic idea. Instead of getting something like Norfolk Southern uh, or local shortline, I could instead get a leasing unit, like from Progress Rail or GITX or FERC's, uh, or I could get a locomotive uh, in the paint scheme of a, a, a short-line conglomerate, like Genesee in Wyoming, or RJ Corman, or SMS lines. And the idea here is that these locomotives, at least in theory, can reasonably be seen anywhere around the entire country. So if I buy a locomotive in one of these paint schemes, I can take it with me wherever I move next, uh, and it still would look appropriate, no matter where that is, so long as it's in the States. But 
Then, all of a sudden, two things were released at once. First, Bachman released their simply gorgeous Siemens Charger locomotives, which is just stunning and fantastic in model making. And then Electrotrain, a European manufacturer, actually released a ready-to-run model of the Talgo train sets. And I just happened to remember from like 10 years ago that somebody on Shapeways actually made a 3D printed model of the wing cars. So all of a sudden, I now had all of the tools necessary in order to make an Amtrak Cascades Talgo train set. This is fantastic. But oh, wait, there's still a problem. What do I model? Again, Cascades is prototypical. It's tied to a time and a place. And any place and time other than that, it would look out of place. All right, well, there are some other options like uh, the 1990s demonstrator unit that toured the country and is what sold washed out on buying the train sets. Uh, there's also the Milwaukee pair that was intended for use between Chicago, Milwaukee, and Madison until Scott Walker canceled it because he's an awful human being. But again, this is still too niche. Both of those are tied to a time and a place. But, but what if I told you that the original Cascades Talgos weren't the only ones built? There was a fifth. Allow me to introduce to you the Las Vegas Talgo. It was intended for use between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And guess what? It actually did run between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. So why the f wasn't it put into regular service? Oh my goodness, I hate car-brained 1980s and 1990s politicians. They are directly responsible for a lower quality of life for me. If I was born in Europe or China, I get this. But because I'm born here, I don't. It is not as if it was difficult. The train set was already built. The tracks were already there. Okay, calm down, calm down. So the actual Las Vegas Talgos were eventually bought uh, by Washdot and became the Mount Adams train set, and then they robbed them of all of their business class and coach class cars in order to make the other train sets longer, and the only duplicative cars, the two wing cars and the bistro car, sat largely unused for the majority of their lifetime in the Seattle uh, uh, Amtrak yard. And to anybody who knows, uh, the 2017 Point Defiance bypass crash, most of the passenger cars involved in the crash were actually the ones from the Las Vegas Talgo train set, and the crash eventually resulted in the FRA deeming the original Talgo train sets to be insufficiently crashworthy, uh, leading to what was called uh, the Talgo funeral train. But thankfully, uh, one of the bistro cars was saved, uh, uh, and I think they're trying to make it a National Historic Landmark, uh, and the uh, Northwest Railway Museum was able to get a hold of it, and they're building a whole new pavilion, uh, and they're going to make mock-ups of the other passenger cars around the bistro car in order to highlight the history of Cascades to the region. But uh, let's just gloss over that very problematic history for a second, and let's just pretend that the Vegas train set was actually purchased by Brackett State Department of Transportation of wherever I move next, close bracket. And this means that I can model it, but again, I can bring it with me wherever it is that I go next to any of the other clubs, and it wouldn't necessarily be too far out of place. And this has some brilliant side effects. For one, I can uh, mostly reuse the existing Electro Train paint scheme as an interim livery. Uh, it also means I can pair it with the Bachman Surfliner Charger, which is just an absolutely gorgeous locomotive, and altogether, this actually is a phenomenal excuse. I mean, opportunity to model a modern passenger train set. But, 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 but it, it's all just for fun. It's not like I'm modeling it seriously, right? Right? Huh. Wait a second. Huh? 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 Ah! What if I use the Talgo train set to model an as-of-yet unbuilt passenger route? Okay, okay, that's interesting, uh, but uh, there, there are too many options. What do I look for? All right, well, uh, uh, let, let's start with uh, population density. These are the places that have enough people right now, big enough cities to support passenger rail. Uh, but let's also uh, compare this with growth. These are the places that are ascendant, that are growing, that are likely to build out future-facing infrastructure, as opposed to places that are currently shrinking, which are probably not thinking about future population growth. Let's combine them together uh, in order to, to, to get an equal balance between the two, and then let's overlay the Amtrak Connect Us map on top of it. It, and several regions definitely pop out as being worth investigating. Uh, so what I did is I looked at all of these with the Open Streets map, which is uh, slightly better than Google Maps uh, because it more clearly shows uh, the, the railroad tracks and whether or not they're main tracks, uh, 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 yard or industry tracks, and uh, whether or not they're in active service. Sometimes it names the industries, but the single most important thing is that it names the railroad subdivisions, which is extremely useful for figuring out who owns which stretch of track and for doing follow-up research to figure out what kind of traffic and density the line sees. 
So the first thing that pops to mind is the Texas Triangle. Uh, this is a major railroading hub with very large populations, and there are uh, uh, several light rail and DMU systems in at least three of the cities, but two trips a day, three trips a day, nothing great, and there's also potential competition from the Texas High Speed Rail. Oh, and also Texas doesn't want me to exist, so I'm going to pretend that Texas doesn't exist at all. Um, all right, let, let's look somewhere else. Maybe the Southern Cross. This is another one, a growing city with a, a very nice mix of both big cities and small towns, but again, eh, two trips a day, three trips a day, and I also don't have any sort of personal connection to the region. I don't find it too appealing. There's also not really much uh, good modern transit. If I were to look at anything, it would probably be Atlanta to Charlotte, um, in part because Charlotte has modern light rail and streetcars that are very successful. It's also a reasonable city pair, and you get to throw in a good old-fashioned long-distance route as well, the Crescent, but it's also a very long route with, again, not that many round trips, and I'm also not too connected to the region either. All right, well, uh, let's look in the other corner, maybe the Southwest. Uh, this is a very fast-growing region, Arizona especially, with a large light rail network in Phoenix and two very successful streetcars in both Phoenix and Tucson, and uh, major space-related universities in both, so there's a very good chance that I might end up going there. But also, when you think of uh, modern urbanism, you don't exactly think of the hot desert and endless suburbia uh, of the Pacific Southwest. All right, maybe not quite there. Uh, maybe let's uh, cut in the middle. As a front-range passenger rail. This is good. There's another major space-related university in Boulder. Uh, Denver has a very large light rail network. It's a popular, growing, progressive region uh, that has good transit. It's also just simply gorgeous scenery with the front range, but also, eh, the joint line has been done to death, uh, and uh, plans for front range passenger rail have been in the works since Atlanta sunk, so may not actually end up being a thing here. Eh, ah well, it was a fun idea while it lasted. I guess there really aren't any good proto-future types for me. Wait a second, what's that? Minneapolis to Dulleth? Fake news, never heard of that. Okay, uh, Northern Lights Express, eight trains a day, shorter distance, fewer stations, more modelable, and, and not just in terms of layout size, but also in terms of fewer train sets required to operate it. And, and in fact, it's actually very likely to get built. They call it uh, a shovel-ready project. So they have uh, blueprints of every single square centimeter of the entire line going uh, from Minneapolis to Duluth. Uh, in fact, uh, they, uh, not only do they have detailed maps, they also have a published schedule, so I know exactly what the train is going to look like. It's, it's less work for me. Uh, they also have uh, uh, plans for the station architecture. So uh, even though it's not yet built, uh, I now want to make the point that it is now possible to model the future as a prototype. All of these planning documents are like a prototype research uh, documents prepared for you by somebody else. Less work for me. Okay, this is fun. Uh, it starts uh, in downtown Minneapolis at Target Field Station, which is much smaller and more modelable than St. Paul Union Depot, or SPUD, as it's called. Uh, it's also adjacent to a light rail station, and it has a a commuter rail uh, departures as well, um, and I could build a very fancy head house here uh, in this unused parking lot right next to the stadium. Okay, that's fun. That's an idea. Uh, on the other end, you have the Duluth Depot, which is jointly used by the Lake Superior Railroad Museum and the North Shore Scenic Railroad, and they have plans for a very small nearby layover facility. Oh, it's like, look at how small and pike-sized this is. It's just like, what is it, five, six tracks? It's not too difficult. Um, eh, nothing's perfect. Uh, it, it has the wrong station uh, in the Twin Cities. It misses the Empire Builder, and they would share only about a mile or so of its length, so th th that's a fun rail fanning opportunity th that I would be completely missing. Um, also, in Minneapolis-St. Paul, there are enormous, unmodelable yards, but in between the Twin Cities and the Twin Ports, there are long, boring, single-track stretches of route filled with irrelevant Lake Wobegons. In the Port of Superior, there is an absolute mess of tracks as well, making it difficult to model faithfully. The Duluth Station Museum doesn't exactly scream future, does it? Duluth also has some problematic highways that obscure views of the tracks, uh, uh, and it would make it difficult to switch the station. Uh, along the route, though, there are also a series of low bridges, which actually preclude intermodal traffic, and currently, uh, one of the reasons why they would have such a high passenger train frequency is because there are so few freight trains, mostly boring uh, bulk unit trains uh, running on it right now. And then at the time when I was looking into this, it was politically uncertain, and I didn't want to get too invested in something that ended up failing, such that every time I would go to my model railroad room, I would look at something that would remind me of a heartbreak. So, eh, okay, maybe 
is there any way we can fix this? Um, uh, many of you have heard of the Northwest Passage, uh, but an interesting thing, uh, with climate change and the melting of sea ice, uh, it now looks like it actually will become a major shipping route from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And paradoxically, it's actually a shorter route, and it's more eco-friendly. Uh, go figure. Alright, so say that in 5-10 years this ends up happening, um, uh, uh, maybe say that you have some cargo that's uh, bound for the center of the country, and rather than uh, offloading it in either the Pacific or the Atlantic, why not just send a few container ships uh, down into Hudson Bay, maybe have a, a new intermodal container port there, and then once you have containers getting off there, maybe you just uh, have a major uh, north-south railroad route from Hudson's Bay to the center of the country. Now, here's a really wacky idea. Uh, this is the route of the Northern Lights Express, as it's planned. Say that this uh, intermodal uh, route f uh, through the Northwest Passage becomes a thing. Probably the most obvious thing to do would be to build a new stretch of track between Thunder Bay and Duluth. And if you are already running freight trains there, you may as well run a passenger train too. extend the Northern Lights Express. And this has a bunch of uh, benefits. Uh, you now have through traffic with more diverse freight options. There's also much better scenery with the absolutely stunning beauty of the North Woods uh, on the, the shore of Lake Superior. And it also makes for a more well-balanced layout. Instead of having uh, an end-heavy and a light middle layout of Minneapolis-Duluth, you now have Minneapolis-Duluth a Thunder Bay, a beginning, middle, and end to your railroad story. This is a much better railroading idea. But, as fascinating as it is, it's a bit much even for me. Uh, ah well, I guess I shan't model an Amtrak Connectus route after all. Or I could look at other regional plans that didn't make it onto the Amtrak Connect Us route map. Uh, allow me to introduce to you ZipRail. This would connect Minnesota's three largest cities, uh, Minneapolis, Rochester, and the other one. Uh, and importantly, in Rochester, there's the Mayo Clinic, which is a world-class medical institution that has a highly peripatetic population. But currently, the only way to get from the Twin Cities airport to uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic is to rent a car. And the sicker you are, the less capable you are of safely piloting a vehicle. So this is a very dumb series of perverse incentives. So it makes a lot of sense to have a direct public transit route from the airport uh, to Rochester, but there's one minor flaw. There has never been a direct rail connection between the t uh, Twin Cities and Rochester. All right, well, say that we were to build this. Uh, how exactly would we get there? Well, probably the first most obvious answer is to go south from Red Wing. Uh, this is, I think, the shortest route, but unfortunately it runs into the Mississippi River Bluffs, which are a bit too tall and a bit too steep to be attacked by a train. All right, uh, let's look at another route. Maybe let's take it over from Northfield. Uh, this is much flatter, more doable, and it's also a little bit easier uh, uh, to get right-of-way for, because it's just mostly empty agricultural land. All right, now, how do we actually get to Northfield? Probably the most obvious answer is the Union Pacific's Albert Lea subdivision, starting from the St. Paul Union Depot. But actually, getting to Northfield is an absolute mess. Again, enormous unmodelable yards, endless switching areas, and half of a very large uh, prototype-based layout would be just Twin Cities switching areas. So it's a, an excellent real-world train, but just a poor modeling subject. Or we could look at the Dan Patch Line instead. This was long considered for extension of the North Star commuter rail until an idiot congressperson put a ban uh, on studying it in 2002. But it is the natural extension from Target Field Station, uh, which is currently going to be served by both the North Star and, when it gets spilled, the Northern Lights Express. It's currently partially operated by Minneapolis Northfield and Southern and partially rail banked, and they recently uh, developed a workaround of that stupid ban by uh, studying the Central Minnesota Passenger Rail Corridor, which looks at all possible possible routes between Target Field Station and Northfield, including the Dan Patch Line, or other lines as well. Uh, and so th this is an excellent way that hopefully very soon they're going to be able to bring very high quality frequent commuter rail uh, uh, on a more regional scope, rather than uh, the, the stunted runt of a line that they have right now. But if you were to do this, it actually has some collateral benefits. So here's the current route of the Empire Builder and the soon-to-be TCMC, Twin Cities, Milwaukee, Chicago, or I think they just recently renamed it to the Great River, which is going to be a second daily round trip uh, between the Twin Cities uh, and Chicago. Um, but say that you were to build this route from Minneapolis to Rochester, and then maybe wrap it into more regional plans and take it south to Des Moines, Iowa as well. If you were to do this, if you were to build this new track between Northfield and Rochester, you could actually reroute both the Empire Builder and the TCMC from Winona through Rochester to get an additional two free round trips a day, bonus for the Minnesota Department of Transportation that it doesn't have to pay for between Rochester and the Twin Cities. This is an excellent idea. It also would allow you to consolidate all of the Twin Cities area passenger trains into one station. Rather than splitting them 50-50 between St. Paul and Minneapolis, now everything goes through Target Field Station, allowing you cross-platform transfers. And since you already have uh, the, the North Star commuter rail, let's just extend it from its current terminus of Big Lake to St. Cloud and south to Northfield, again, providing a very good regional uh, rail system uh, that helps serve southeastern Minnesota. 
And coming out of Target Field Station, it actually parallels a light rail extension, so it would be really fun to run intercity passenger trains and light rail trains right next to each other. And in Rochester, they have plans for a bus rapid transit system, which could very easily be turned into a streetcar. It's like... <sighs> Fuck, I think this is too perfect to pass up on. I, I think I don't have a choice except to model it. All right, okay, Um, how could we turn this into a layout? Well, unfortunately, again, excellent real-world train, bad modeling subject, because it hopscotches between host railroads. It would be taking uh, Canadian Pacific, or I guess now CPKC, between uh, uh, the Twin Cities and Mason City, but then the rest of the route to Des Moines is along uh, the Union Pacific. So, all right, Um, is there a way we can work around this? Well, uh, the first idea is maybe just to focus on the northern half of the line. There's actually a small transfer yard in Mason City, and there is a yard in Des Moines that looks almost exactly like an open-air staging yard. So if we just scenic the staging yard on the southern end of the route, and then build a train station, then instead of having the passenger trains be the only trains that could run the entire length of the route, now we can run both the passenger and the freight trains along most of the layout, uh, and we just have a small a transfer uh, between uh, the uh, a yard in Mason City and uh, right around the corner to open staging in Des Moines. Um, and then also, by scenicing uh, and making uh, a station in the staging yard of Des Moines staging, you can still also run the passenger train the entire length of its route, more or less. All right, say that that doesn't work, let's also have another option. We can just entirely abandon Iowa, we can turn this uh, into a southern extension of the Northern Lights Express, but importantly, this does preserve a reroute of the Empire Builder and TCMC. And the freight focus here would be a little bit more on a freight bypass. Say that there's congestion in the St. Paul Yards area. Actually, I think there is real-world congestion uh, on the freight routes in the St. Paul Yard area. So in this case, say that um, uh, uh, CPKC needed to get some trains uh, to Minneapolis, or maybe they were just through-running trains uh, and just needed to get around the Twin Cities. Maybe it would be cheaper and more time-efficient uh, to offload that capacity from the St. Paul area, uh, and then just to rent some time on the MnDOT-owned track between Rochester uh, and Northfield. Uh, so the freight focus here would be a little bit more on through trains. And then uh, let let's have a, a final option here. This would be the realistic option, utilizing only existing track between Target Field and Rochester. In this case, the passenger operations would be a much slower kind of regional, sub-regional. Maybe you could have an extension to Winona to offer a cross-platform transfer to the Empire Builder and TCMC, and the freight switching focus would be mostly urban switching, with maybe a little bit of the uh, Dakota, Minnesota, and Eastern Main Line between Awatona and Rochester. But, oh, um, w wait a second, I already have a layout. Um, okay, uh, yeah, th this is the layout that I built. Uh, y you can see that um, I intended to eventually expand and fill the entire room, but I, I was currently sitting at just a floating staging yard in the middle of the room right there. All right, well, um, maybe, maybe is there anything that I could do to, to share this space with another layout? Is there anything I can do to have both? Uh, wh what can they both share? All right, well, they're both uh, uh, HO gauge track, HO scale, and ON30, so maybe they could both share a staging yard. Okay, that's actually a really good idea, and it's actually very useful. And in fact, no, let's make it a sliding drawer staging yard, so I don't have to worry about any turnout length, and I can make it uh, many tracks deep, so I can store a bunch of trains, both the, the uh, modern HO scale and the uh, old ON30. Okay, th uh, well, this is actually a brilliant idea. It saves a lot of space, but um, now what do I do with it? Okay, well, uh, maybe, maybe let's just minimize the scope. Let's let's focus only on Rochester, make it a smaller one-town layout, but this does preserve the uh, main idea of a near-future uh, uh, passenger-heavy southeastern Minnesota. Um, and uh, let, let's just simplify. Let's uh, nix the uh, extension to Des Moines, and let, let's just simply make it a timetable extension of the Northern Lights Express uh, southward from Target Field. But importantly, this does keep the Empire Builder and the TCMC, which is fun, because who doesn't like running more passenger choo-choos? Um, and then also, eh, just for the hell of it, let's extend the North star. Athern already made uh, uh, equipment for that, locomotives uh, and passenger cars, so I I'll find them on eBay eventually. Um, but, you know, let, yeah, let's just for the hell of it, let's also add a regional uh, commuter DMU service here, um, uh, between Awatona and Rochester. And the idea is that, say, with all of this new track construction, maybe uh, people in Awatona were mad that they were left out of this uh, new expensive passenger rail endeavor, and they wanted better access to get back and forth to the Twin Cities. But also, this is the future. Rochester is growing. And maybe say that there are some doctors and nurses who don't want to live in the hustle and bustle of Rochester, and they instead said wants to live in a uh, small town Minnesota. By having a commuter DMU going all the way out to Awatona, uh, they could live in any of these small towns and then commute into the Mayo Clinic for work and then commute back to their family in the evening. So this actually makes very much real world sense and it's an excuse to run a passenger DMU as well. So th this is what I ended up making. Um, and it's a, t a twice around mainline run to give as much mainline length as possible. 
And yeah, yeah, it's an obscenely narrow 30-inch wide aisle that can only be accessed by a four and a half foot roll under axis, but eh, I'm already a lone wolf. But the main focus here would be uh, at, at a major transfer train station uh, uh, at Rochester uh, sitting above the uh, sliding drawer staging. And to orient you, so uh, to the upper left uh, would be going uh, to uh, the Twin Cities, to the bottom left would be heading over to Awatona, and to the right would be heading to Chicago. Now, here's the next truly ridiculous idea. What is something that is unavoidably, inescapably modern? Something that you cannot live in the modern world without experiencing at some point or another. How about a four-lane highway? And maybe at some point, I can make this an operating highway with the Faller car system, the European little self-driving car things. That that would actually be really fun. Um, maybe I can hide the quote-unquote highway staging, the turn-back loops with backdrops, and I could hide the holes with highway signs. Um, but the main focus here would be on, on this upper segment, paralleling uh, the, the uh, uh, passenger train tracks. There's this beautiful segment on Amtrak Cascades where the passenger trains run right down the middle of the highway, or more like, excuse me, the highway r runs right down the middle of the passenger train tracks. The, 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 the trains came first. And it led to some opportunities for just simply gorgeous pacing shots between the trains uh, and the cars. And, and just, just imagine this. I don't think anybody has really made this before. Imagine a near future passenger train running down the tracks and then little operating vehicles buzzing back and forth in front of them. It would be absolutely gorgeous and fantastic. All right, anyway, let, let's fill in the details. So let's start by taking that bus rapid transit system and turning it into a proper streetcar. Uh, let's maybe add a gas station. This is definitely going to be a Sheets, not Wawa's, Bucky's, or Culver's. Um, uh, let's have a nice little pedestrian plaza right out front of the main passenger station headhouse with a nice hip downtown neighborhood um, uh, with uh, outdoor streeteries and walkable urbanism and bike lanes. Uh, maybe on the backdrop, we could have a, a building flat of the Mayo Clinic uh, and then maybe 45 degree angle mirrors to uh, cut into the roadway to make it look like it extends beyond the backdrop. And okay, yes, I do happen to know that this is a very passenger heavy track plan, so I have a, a backup option here. If at any point I get too bored with the passenger choo-choos, I, I, I can build the second level, which uh, coming up from Rochester, uh, th there would be the operations and maintenance facility for the DMUs, maybe a park and ride and parking structure, um, and then you could uh, end the DMU line in downtown Awatona. But the main thing here is that you have a bunch of industry spurs as well. Maybe I could even operate this as a tiny little uh, short line interchanging uh, with the mainline freight trains. Um, but probably the most important thing here is I'm going to include some staging on the uh, back side of the backdrop here, which would allow the freight trains to run the entire length of the visible portion of the track as well, not just be confined to the lower level. And I could actually run multiple different routes of uh, freight trains going in multiple different directions. All right, so what would operations look like? Obviously, the star would be the uh, Northern Lights Express uh, operating with the uh, Talgo train sets with wing cars. Uh, running back and forth between Rochester and Duluth via Minneapolis. Then, of course, you could have the DMUs coming back and forth between Awatona and their own private little uh, MnDOT-operated uh, platform in downtown Rochester. You could also have the North Star commuter rail uh, coming south from uh, St. Cloud uh, via Minneapolis Target Field Station as well. And then uh, you can have the streetcar operating in the foreground. That's always fun to add a little bit of life. If I get really good with the faller car system, maybe they can even share the same lanes. That would be really fun. And then, of course, once a day each way, the Empire Builder could uh, make it stop by with the uh, the new ALC chargers, uh, and then the TCMC would as well. Or, if anybody ends up making it, we could have one of those fancy new aero train sets that um, uh, Amtrak is purchasing with Siemens. It's like, okay, I want to make the point here that through a completely reasonable transit system expansion in the future, I have an excuse to run basically every single kind of passenger train I could ever want to on a very small 7x14 foot layout. This is is absolutely fantastic. And of course, again, if I ever get bored with the passenger trains, I could have any number of through freight trains just running around uh, Rochester. And again, if on top of that I ever get bored, I can build uh, the second level going up to Awatona, uh, offering a destination for the DMUs, and I could take freight trains along the entire length of the layout as well, storing it on the second level staging to boot. So... Where am I now? Well, you bet that before I even finished the track plan, and before I even knew what lengths I would be cutting most of the wood to, I ended up buying a ton of wood. So the first major hurdle that I needed to get over uh, was the sliding uh, staging drawer. I needed to find a way where I could extend it all the way out, uh, and it would not sag in a way that would uh, mess with track alignments. I was, in fact, able to successfully do that. Uh, the next major hurdle was to find a way to float Rochester over top the staging drawer. The staging drawer is 9 feet long, and the Rochester segment is 11 feet long 
on top of that. So because of the staging drawer, I can't have any vertical supports over the length of uh, Rochester, so I had to find a way where I could uh, effectively float it over that 11-foot distance over top the staging. What I ended up doing was I took um, uh, aluminum wall studs and I put them uh, back to back, effectively making um, uh, uh, aluminum box girders, uh, and so far they seem to not exactly be sagging. Now, this might not be a perfect system, it might absolutely backfire on me eventually, but I'll deal with that later. And then the last major hurdle was I needed to find a way where I could um, have all of the different tracks of the staging drawers uh, meeting up with each other. It's not just a simple thing of one track to any other tracks, it's multiple tracks to multiple combinations of those same tracks again, seeing as both sides will have three approach tracks to all of the uh, nine or ten tracks on the staging drawer. And it seems that I have been able to do that successfully, but as a backup, every single mating track uh, uses uh, re-railer sections just, just to make sure that nothing too bad happens. Um, oh, yeah, and then also... There was something a little bit ago about uh, building a uh, Talgo train set. Well, um, here's what I've been able to accomplish so far. Yee! Okay, okay. Now, obviously, I have not completely painted uh, the, the train set yet. That's going to be the next major hurdle that hopefully I can get to quite soon. Uh, I need to teach myself how to airbrush with Vallejo paints. But as far as things are right now, I'm pretty certain that this is the first time anybody would have ever ended up modeling a, a Talgo train set with wings, and definitely the first first time that anybody will have ever modeled the Las Vegas Talgo. It's just, it's, it's just so fantastic. This brings me so much naive and uncontrollable exuberance. Okay, and then I also happen to acquire some DMUs as well. Maybe I will someday repaint these uh, into the uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation colors found on the light rail, but that's also fun too. It, it, again, just near future passenger trains. Okay, just, just anyway. Okay, calm down, G4, calm down. All of this entire crazy journey of mine aside, what is it that we can learn from my tale of cognitive decline? Well, for one, America is absolutely behind in rail investment among the developed world. As you can see quite clearly here from these maps of uh, passenger rail of the United States, Europe, and China. But you already know that. Is there anything that I can add to the discussion that would be new or useful information? Well, for one, the scholarly data shows uh, quite definitively that, quote, housing prices are positively correlated with walkability score. Um, also, a, a recent uh, analysis done by the Parking Reform Network showed that in basically every American city except San Diego, Houston, Atlanta, Buffalo, and Miami, housing prices are more expensive in more walkable areas, which means that if you as a homeowner want to enrich your own personal uh, uh, net worth uh, and your community, uh, you will uh, opt in favor of making more uh, walkable walkable rail transit associated communities, except of course in Houston where it makes it more expensive, but you still should do it anyway. Uh, also, as you can see here, since light rail's wide scale adoption uh, in the 1990s, it has seen the most growth of any form of transit ridership. Uh, people take the bus because they have to, people take the train because they want to. Additionally, as we learned uh, mostly around COVID, uh, people who walk, ride, or take the train to work are happier than those who drive. Um, uh, so uh, rail transit uh, is a way for a higher quality quality of life. Uh, and then also, uh, this was a uh, recent data from the uh, Washington Post Department of Data, the other DOD. They show that uh, Zoomers are getting uh, significantly fewer driver's licenses uh, than people of their same age uh, uh, in 1997, uh, whereas conversely, older generations uh, are driving more than they used to in 1997. Uh, and this is consistent with a single uh, peak uh, car-obsessed generation that is now and hopefully soon will be aging out, whereas people who are growing up right now are opting for significantly less car dependency. And then also, finally, trains are simply better because there are no middle seats, you are not a sardine, and seats are made for comfort, not flotation. So, overall, vote in favor of trains and dense, walkable, transit-oriented, car-free, equitable, and climate-friendly urban environments, but most importantly, vote in favor of trains. We're all model railroaders here. This should not be controversial at all. But as pertains to model railroading, well, there actually kind of was an inciting incident that set me off making these three presentations, uh, and, and that was uh, the formation of a new club in my uh, uh, home community, which, to protect the innocent, I'm going to call the Middlemost Municipal Unit Society for Railway Modeling. Um, and because I was kind of a major modeling figure in the area, I was wrapped in uh, on their email discussions, and there was one email that was sent out by a uh, particularly elderly and loquacious member, uh, who in one sentence decided for the entire group that they 
were modeling the transition era. There was absolutely no discussion, nobody pushed back on him for this at all, it was decided in one go. And the thing is, I'd actually read the history of the region's railroads, and the 1890s, 1910s, and 1990s were all much more interesting times for railroading for this particular area, and it made absolutely no sense to model the 1950s. But this was especially bad because the club was going to be based in a college town, where more than 40% of the population during the semester would be under the age of 25. And this is significant because a super majority of younger generations have significantly less nostalgia for the 1950s than older generations. And this being a college town, by that one decision of choosing to model the transition era, before you laid an inch of flex track, before you even uh, turned a screw once for the benchwork, you automatically turned off 25% of possible members of the club. And that was a really dumb idea from the perspective of a model railroad club, and I was extremely irritated. But the irritation got me thinking. Um, and so, of course, we all know that the transition era is a popular time for modeling, right? Um, and these data are actually uh, from the Model Railroader Magazine track plan database, um, track plan entries by the era of the prototype of the track plan as of last year. Uh, and, and the thing is, I'm a scientist. I had to take statistics classes. And this is what a normalized distribution would look like. But as you can see here, there is extra representation in the transition era and missing representation uh, in the uh, abutting eras if we were to assume a truly stochastic randomized choice of prototype. Um, all right, well, we've heard a bunch of reasons for this. One of them is you get to run both steam trains and diesel trains. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, diesel trains were invented in the 19-teens and popularized in the 1930s. Um, and then also, since the transition era, there's been an almost uninterrupted uh, series of uh, steam mainline excursions. What? Your model railroad is too small for a mainline steam excursion? Well, you could model one of North America's over 300 tourist railroads and museums. But why would you choose to model something unique and interesting when you could model the transition era instead? All right, well, another one that we always hear is that it was the glory days of small town America. Well, not actually. I happened to look at the census data, and small town America peaked in the 1890s and was eclipsed by big city America in the 1920s. So if you actually wanted to model the glory days of small town America, it would be in one of the earlier eras, definitely not the 1950s. That's when things were starting to get really bad on a one-way downward trend. All right, I've also heard people refer to it as the golden age of railroading, but that's also an arbitrary delineation. I've heard that referred to the 1880s uh, and the present era, at least before precision scheduled railroading. And the last reason why you might want to model the transition era is that you get to model streamlined passenger trains. Well, that's not exactly true, as I hope I've shown you. You can also model them now, too. Anyway, so I think there's a little bit of a nostalgia problem going on in the hobby, and part of this stems from the fact that I was told once at a model railroad convention, every model railroad is autobiographical, meaning that people disproportionately choose to model their childhood memories. But I want to make an important point here that nostalgia is not the same thing as appreciating history. Much more often than not, it involves glossing over serious flaws in the narrative in exchange for a more whitewashed feel-good history. Actual historicity involves acknowledging the good parts of history as well as the bad, in proportional measure to what it actually was like. Now, the thing is, I understand the fascination with history. Remember, I started this presentation modeling in the 1890s. But for most of the hobby to be about an unrealistic return to an idealized past, that doesn't seem right to me at all. But the thing that really drives me nuts the most is when people say, trains aren't as important as they used to be, or trains aren't relevant to kids these days. I hope that I've shown you over the course of these three presentations that that is utter bullshit. Trains are still here. In fact, they're even growing. They just look differently to how they were. Now, I will admit, route miles are down, but again, that's because of a brief and abusive dalliance with the automobile. Now it looks like younger generations are going to significantly prefer public transit in ways much like they used to be. They just look different from all of the things that we used to see in the past. Don't ignore them because of that, please. Now, I honestly love the way that I ended my first presentation with this lovely little Punnett Square. These were the things that were running through most major cities in the Northeast in the 1920s, and these were the things that were being made by the hobby manufacturers at the time. So you could, as a young child, have a little train running around your war on Christmas tree, and you could pick up the model, walk down to the center of the village, and hold it up next to the real thing. But these are the things that we have running in more than 60 cities in North America, in almost half of all states and provinces, but can you buy a model of them? No, because they don't exist, because nobody makes them, because the hobby has a little bit of a problem with nostalgia. All right, let's extend this Punnett Square a little bit to encompass the scope of layouts as well. These are the cities that kids these days disproportionately care about, 
dense, walkable, transit-oriented environments. But these are the things that a lot of clubs are modeling these days. Small-town America. In fact, more importantly, car-dependent small-town America. Another one. These are the passenger trains that kids these days care about. These are the ones that they are riding. These are the ones that are growing in scope with every passing day. And these are the ones that will presumably and quite hopefully be very important to the future culture of the country. But these are the passenger trains that people are modeling. Old-fashioned streamliners, which, again, it's important to acknowledge history, but for all of the hobby to be about an obsession with history to the detriment of the present? That is not how you have a sustainable hobby. This is not how you capture the interests of the next generation. In fact, I want to make the point here that uh, youngsters like trains, they just specifically like modern trains. And to make that point, here are the first 24 YouTube channels that I found on the subject of modern transit and urbanism, and cumulatively they have 6 million subscribers. But importantly, more than half of all of these creators are under the age of 30. So it's clear that there is an interest out there, but is the hobby reflecting that interest? No, not at all. Here are, as of this year, all of the locomotives that Rapido makes by year of the proto type of the model. And as you can see, again, here, there is in fact a massive overrepresentation in the transition era. In fact, Rapido only makes one thing that has ever been operating during my lifetime, ironically the NPCU cabbage unit. This is technically structural inequality. This is technically saying that my childhood memories matter less than other people's childhood memories who just happen to be older. Now, I will freely admit that the structural inequality of being systematically targeted by a police state and systematically disenfranchised from generations wealth by redlining is probably a little bit more important to deal with than the structural inequality of I can't buy my choo-choos, but you'd also be hard-pressed to say that the hobby doesn't have a problem and that these are data pointing it out right here. Um, now, uh, let's just, for sake of argument, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say that people get more nostalgic as they age, and furthermore, as people themselves get older, they have more disposable income and uh, are more likely to indulge that sense of nostalgia. But my worry is, what will they become nostalgic for? for. Are they going to become nostalgic for all of the 1950s set club layouts uh, that model a time uh, and an era that is entirely irrelevant to their life, or are they going to become nostalgic for the things that they're doing right now, like Microsoft Train Simulator or Train Z Simulator? I even learned recently that there is a virtual reality train simulator where you can put on your VR goggles and walk around your living room as if you're operating a train around a railroad. And so my worry is that because we're not capturing the interests of the young people right now, we're not going to have a generation of model railroaders, we're going to end up with a generation of model programmers. Now, to be clear, I'm not trying to cancel the transition era or anything. Rather, my point is I think the hobby is in a bit of a rut, and that rut is squarely about 40 to 50 years ago. And because of this, it has trouble appealing to younger generations. Not everyone has to model the present, or gods forbid the near future, but my point is that at least some of the hobby could evolve with the times, and I think that this is especially important for club layouts, as they are the public-facing ambassadors of the hobby. Importantly, if you're in a major metropolitan area thinking of starting up another railroad club, and there's already a club in the area modeling the 1950s, I beg of you, do not choose to model the transition era. Model something else instead, please. <sighs> anyway, now, I want to end on this long quote, um, uh, and so of course the moment I started making this presentation series, I, I, I got books on Minnesota railroads in order to learn more about the history and the present of the railroading landscape, um, and uh, this was actually in the introduction of the book Minnesota Railroads by Steve Glashinsky, and I know it's a long quote, but bear with me as it does a really good job at communicating what it is that I think the important takeaway should be. Many railroad groups of the early 1970s had a nonchalant attitude. The steam engines and passenger trains they had grown up with were gone, and so were many of the railroads. They simply could not comprehend why I would want to get out and take pictures of contemporary railroading. Why do you bother, they would say. All the neat stuff is gone, and everything today looks the same. By the 1980s and 90s, I was no longer the youngest guy in our railroad groups, and another change occurred. People started to appreciate the photographs I had taken when I first started out. The lesson wasn't lost on me. Many things had changed, and somewhat by accident, accident, others and I had been documenting those changes in photographs. While the public wasn't looking, railroads returned from the brink of oblivion and are now the forefront of transportation success and innovation. I look back at the slides I took at Dayton's Bluff in the 1970s and see weedy, uneven track and roadbed. The same area today has heavy welded rail, new signaling systems, and nary a weed in sight. This book is a salute to railroad history, but also recognizes that railroading is here to stay. Despite the colorful and fascinating past of railroad, their best days may still be to come. 
So, ultimately, all of this aside, why am I choosing to model the near future? For one, I love the potential of modern, frequent regional passenger rail. I love the futuristic luster of a well-branded train set. I want to encourage the expansion and use of car-replacing infrastructure. And I'm optimistic for whatever the future holds. Thank you so very much for bearing with me through these three presentations. Uh, I think I have a lot of things to say that the hobby kind of needs to hear, and I hope that you would agree with me on that. I hope that maybe I have inspired you to look at your own model railroads a little bit differently, um, and then otherwise, I uh, hope that I've inspired you to go out there and talk to your elected representatives and demand more choo-choos, because, well, more choo-choos is a good thing. Thank you so very much again, and happy modeling.